I'm glad that we as a church uh, have a vision and a view uh, toward going and toward sending. Uh, you know, going and sending has always, has always been a part uh, of the Christian faith. It's, it has always been a part of this church, and it will continue to be. I want to just tell you a, a, a couple of stories, a personal impact of somebody who understood the importance of going. Um, there was a lady by the name of Joy Ritterhoff, and uh, when I was in the third grade, I was going to vacation Bible school, and Joy Ritterhoff was a missionary who had been with an organization called Gospel Recordings. I don't think it even exists anymore. And she came to our vacation Bible school, and she was the guest speaker for the week. And I remember her saying to us, if you can believe it, you know, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but I remember what she said that X number of years ago, that uh, she said to us, just because your parents are Christians and you grew up going to church doesn't mean that you're a Christian and that you're going to heaven. And I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm in church Sunday morning, I go back Sunday night, you know, we go a couple times during the week, yeah, I should be, I should be good. And, and she went on to say, we're separated from God by the sin in our lives. Uh, and because of that, you know, Ephesians 2, uh, verse, uh, verse 12 says that we're separated from Christ and without God and without hope in the world. And she described that as our condition. And by the way, as Dale has said, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, that is your condition. You're separated from Christ and without God and without hope in the world. Well, as a third grader, I thought you know, the things she was saying sort of made sense. And so, as well as I could understand it as a third grader, I asked God to forgive my sin, I asked Jesus to come into my life, uh, and that changed my life. Now, why did Joy Ritterhoff come to our church? Why, first off, why was she willing to go as a missionary? Why did she come to our church to tell us kids about Jesus? Why uh, do we, did we send a team to Nepal? Why has the church always been known as an ascending and going uh, institution? I just want to share with you briefly three reasons why we go. First off, we go uh, because Jesus told us to go. Last week, as uh, Dan Wagner was uh, preaching, he uh, shared with us this, this verse, uh, this passage from Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And Dan really focused on the make disciples. And he did a great job of telling us the importance of making disciples. But I just would say to you this morning that without the going, there is no making of disciples. We go simply because Jesus told us to go. A little bit uh, later on in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the first chapter, uh, verse 8, Jesus is together with his disciples for the last time they're going to see him on earth. And he says to them these words. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus told us uh, to go next door. That would be the Jerusalem, the people that live around us. He told us to go to Judea and Samaria. That would be you know, maybe the towns next to us or the states or you know, uh, the areas around our country. And then he told us specifically to go to the end of the earth. When I was in the fourth grade, uh, I had a, a, a teacher at church say to me one day, she said, Chris, one day you're going to be a preacher, or I'm going to eat my hat. Uh, and, you know, as a fourth grader, that didn't sound all that exciting to me. I'd be a preacher, that you know, uh, whatever. I kind of blew it off at the time. But it was about a year later, I was reading a book by a missionary who uh, was an airplane pilot, and he gave his life. Uh, he tells this whole story about, I mean, his whole story is told about him going uh, to make a difference in the, in the lives of people that wouldn't hear unless he went. And I thought, missionary pilot, I could do that. That sounded exciting to me as, a, as like a fifth grader. And so actually for the next 15 years of my life or so, that's what I worked toward doing. I uh, began to, to think about and plan for, and even later on uh, train to become a missionary pilot. I felt compelled to go because Jesus said to go. And that's why we go. Jesus tells us to. But we also go because the need is great. The need is great today, uh, maybe even greater than it was when Jesus spoke these words in Mark 9, verses 37 and 38. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore. Some versions say, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. We go because the need is plentiful. The Joshua Project, which is an organization that 
uh, works toward uh, uh, spreading the gospel to unreached people around the world, estimates that there is 2.8 billion unreached people that live in this region of the world, outlined by the black line there. That's uh, the areas of North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. 2.8 billion unreached people. I don't know about you, that's a staggering uh, number to me. I can't even comprehend it. What is the difference between this group of people and, say, uh, the, the people that you live next door to? You know, we're surrounded by people in our communities, in our neighborhood, at our schools that don't know Jesus. They're separated from Christ and they're without hope in the world. The lady that lives next door to me, Gabriella is her name, uh, she doesn't know Jesus. But she's different than this group of people because Gabriella lives here in Placentia. Uh, she lives in a community where there's hundreds of Christian churches. Any time of the day or night, she can turn on a, the TV or a radio and she can hear, a, 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 she can hear the gospel preached. She has plenty of opportunity to hear. Goodness sakes, she lives next door to a pastor who ought to care about whether or not she's going to heaven. She still needs Jesus, but she's not a part of an unreached people group. The people that live in this region that this map describes are unreached in that they simply will not even have the opportunity to hear the gospel unless we go. They're just not going to have the opportunity. And so I was learning to fly because that's what I was going to be a missionary pilot. Uh, and one of the very basic, first basic rules you learn when you're learning to fly is to trust your instruments. Uh, and I knew that. My instructors had drilled it into me. And I was uh, taking my training out of San Diego. And we were on a little trip out of San Diego out to Yuma. Uh, and it was uh, clear in San Diego, clear in Yuma. And I didn't have my instrument rating yet. Uh, but I could get up over the top of clouds. And it was legal to fly like that. So I, that's what we were doing. I'm flying along. And the clouds start to break. And I see this little body of water out there. And I'm looking at my map. And I'm looking at the body of water. And I'm thinking, you know, that, that might be the Salton Sea. Uh, because, uh, you know, that's what it looks like it is on my map, and the instruments aren't telling me it's the Salton Sea, but I'm beginning to convince myself in my mind that I'm in the wrong place because the Salton Sea is restricted airspace, and if you fly into that, they can, like, shoot you down. Uh, and so I think, oh, I'm going to just go around the Salton Sea and be safe and everything. And in just a short period of time, I figured out, I don't know where I'm at. I'm lost. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I, I got on the radio and I called the Los Angeles Radar Service. They have this great thing that you can call them and say, hey, um, I'm not really lost, but I'm not sure where I'm at. And they can say, as they did back over the radio to me, be advised that you're about 30 miles inside Mexican airspace. We suggest you fly north and get back across the border. <laughs> I love the story. Why do I tell the story? Because I was lost, but I had the resources to get found. People who are part of unreached people groups don't have the resources to be found. They can't just say, oh, I'm going to flip on the radio and hear a gospel story. No, we got to go. We have to go. We have to tell them. Pastor and author David Platt uh, uh, made this observation. He says, to be born in an unreached people group means to be born, to live, and die, and the likelihood is that you will never hear the gospel. You know, many of us are, are praying for our church, we're praying for our leadership, we're praying uh, that God will send the, not, the, the next right lead pastor, and that's the right thing to be praying, but how many of us are praying, as Jesus told us to pray in Matthew 9, that the Lord would raise up workers for the harvest. The need is great. And then finally we go because few Christians are willing to go. Few Christians are willing to obey the call. Jesus' call to go is clear. And yet so few are willing to respond. And let me just say this. If you have been in the church for any period of time, this church or any other church, nothing I've said so far this morning is new to you. You've heard it before. What the Apostle Paul says. He says, how then can they call on the one that they've not believed and how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And you've heard this over and over and over and over and yet so few of us are willing to respond. And so I just want to ask you the question, are you willing to go? Will you go build a relationship with just one life? We started talking about this before Easter, saying just build a relationship with one life, someone that God is already working in their life, 
a neighbor, a coworker, a fellow student at school, somebody that God is working in. Build a relationship with them so you might have the opportunity to share about Jesus with them. And will you go uh, to serve? You know, some of you need to go on a short-term mission trip, and some of you are going on short-term mission trips. And we've got several trips coming up uh, through the rest of this year. And I encourage you to get on our website and find out information uh, about those trips. But some of you, I believe, God is calling you to give the rest of your life to go so that unreached people groups can hear about Jesus. I just believe he's doing that. And so my question for you is, will you go? God expects us to go. Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah as he's responding to God's call to him to go. And as Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8, he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorsteps and thresholds shook, Isaiah tells us, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to uh, me uh, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has, uh, is taken away, and your sin atoned for. He says, Your sin has been forgiven. You have life. You're no longer separated from God. And then listen to what he says. He said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And then he said, Go tell this people. Will you go? Some of you have responded. Some of you are responding. Um, I I just know that in this service, there are actually quite a few uh, that have made a commitment uh, to go on some short-term teams. And I just, in this hour, I want to just end, uh, wrap up the message by asking you, uh, essentially, if if you've committed and, or you feel like God is calling you to go, if you would just stand. I know that uh, Tim, Tim Hawley, our worship, one of our worship leaders, is going, uh, he's going for like five or six weeks. Lindsay is going to China. Laura and Hannah is somewhere. We have uh, some people that are going on, uh, on uh, a trip to Africa uh, later on in June. We'll actually have a full commissioning for them. Um, d- just look around for a moment, and would you be praying? We have several college students that are going on like five or six week long trips. And, and I'm just praying that God will use them in those experiences. And would you join me as we just uh, pause here in a word of prayer before we uh, wrap up the service? Father, I just thank you for your call on us to go, to make a difference for those that won't hear unless we do go. Pray for those that are just standing right now in this room that uh, are, you have called out uh, and, and are sending. And I just ask, Lord, that you would give them safety as they travel. Um, those that especially are leaving this week, that you would have your hand on them. Uh, that you would use them uh, to minister to the people that they have the opportunity to go to. Lord, for all of us, would you um, affirm your call to us to go and give us willing hearts to be able to go as you uh, lead us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated.